Many people have asked me why I decided to appear with Kent Hovind, and a few discouraged me from doing this. My reason for being here is solely that I believe Hovind is a proliferator of scientific illiteracy, and I want to do what I can to make the public aware of the fallacies of his arguments. Hovind might say that evolution is a religion. Well, he's entitled to his opinion, but it's clearly been stated in the 1994 Peloza decision that evolution defines a biological concept and Peloza's complaint was rejected because the Supreme Court has held unequivocally that while belief in a divine creator of the universe is a religious belief, the scientific theory that higher forms of life have evolved from lower forms is not. So, you know, definition's fine, but the courts aren't buying it. Well, he might then go on about evolution being only a theory. I'm sure sick and tired of hearing that one. You're darn right it's a theory. And um, here are some other things, natural phenomena, that are also only theories. The sphericity of the Earth, gravity, atomic theory, electric theory. They're all very good theories. Now, what is a theory? A good theory is a hypothesis which has been subjected to many tests. They are never proven absolutely true. They're based upon long-term observation and correlation. They're not believed but accepted provisionally. They're strengthened as data from different disciplines are explained and they make predictions that can be tested. And the ev evidence showing that evolution has occurred is stronger than that which shows that the planets go around the sun because it comes from a wider variety of areas. What Dr. Bartelt is doing here is what's called bait and switch in advertising. She's giving one definition of evolution and saying it's just, the theory of evolution is just like gravity and things like that. What they mean by that definition of evolution is microevolution, minor changes. But what they do is they sneak in, a lot, once people accept that definition, they sneak in all sorts of other things that have to do with macroevolution. So watch for the bait and switch tactic, which is, of course, illegal to do in advertising. You can't advertise a new Lincoln for $10,000, and when you show up to buy it, you find out it's a skateboard or a, or a Toyota. Uh, that's illegal. And, but the, by giving two different, by not giving the other real definition of evolution, they do this. She mentions uh, she's, her purpose is to fight against my scientific illiteracy. That is precisely my purpose in life, is to fight against the illiteracy, scientifically, in the theory of evolution. It is bankrupt. There is no evidence to support it at all. So watch for this. One of the frequently asked questions at Hovind's website is, how would you answer critics like Madsen, Babinski, and Bartelt, who have written bad things about you? Bad things, Kent? Well, Dave Matson has written this point-by-point -point refutation of Hovind's Young Earth arguments. This is available. Uh, you can download this from the web. Ed Babinski has written this uh, smaller pamphlet detailing some evangelical Christians who think that the Earth is old. And this is available from Mr. Babinski. Karen, these comments that these uh, fellows have made, uh, Babinski and Madsen, I have read uh, very carefully, and I certainly appreciate anyone who criticizes my ministry. Critics can be your best friend. They can show you things that you're saying that are wrong, and I have definitely made some changes because of their comments. But uh, I w if there's any particular individual one you'd like me to comment on, I'd certainly be glad to on uh, the books that these guys have written about me. The answers that they give to my questions and the criticism they give is absolutely silly, and I felt was not even worth an answer. I'd certainly be glad to debate them or anybody else publicly, and I'd be glad to come debate uh, at any university or college that you know of. I think uh, anyone who reads their answers or reads their comments with an open mind, if they have any questions about it, please call me. I'll be glad to answer anything they have written. I just didn't feel like it was worth wasting time to answer that big book. Like Nehemiah, in the book of Nehemiah, he was asked to come down and stop his great work while they uh, discussed some things with him. His enemies asked him to do that. He said, I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. So I haven't taken time to answer all their critics, but I certainly would be willing to if you'd like to call on the phone, but I will not respond in writing because it simply takes too long. Thank you. My loan contributions were a letter to the Peoria Journal Star in 1993 disputing some of Hovind's assertions and a few calls to the media after I found out that Hovind had misrepresented himself by saying he had scheduled a debate with Stephen Jay Gould. Uh, Karen, the church that was having me speak in Boston did indeed contact Stephen Gould or told me that they had and told me that they had a debate scheduled for Stephen Gould. I did not re misrepresent myself. I honestly thought there was one coming to pass, and I'm still willing to debate Stephen Jay Gould. 
Uh, so that was not a misrepresentation. Please don't say things like that. Why do we say these bad things? Because Hogan's website and seminar notebook are monuments to scientific illiteracy. They contain incorrect information, outdated information, and misrepresentations of scientific principles. All of them straw men. Hogan calls his mistakes gnats, and let's see what you think. The geologic column is a concept fundamental to geology and is one of those big pieces of evidence that supports biological evolution. These sedimentary layers are laid down such that the lowest layer is normally the oldest and contains the least complex life forms. As one goes to higher and higher layers, we see the emergence of more complex life forms. Accusations concerning the geologic column abound in Hovind's publications. He asserts that the geologic column does not exist in the world anywhere except in textbooks, and that it was made up by, by evolutionists to discredit the Bible. What is the reality? Well, first of all, a complete geologic column exists in North Dakota and at least 26 other... Time? Uh, a complete geologic column exists in North Dakota and at least 26 other basins of the world. Was it devised by evolutionists? No. It was devised by Christian creationist geologists like William Smith. William Smith was a creationist. He devised the geologic column in the early 1800s when Darwin was a baby. The geologic column was in wide use by 1830, almost 30 years before Darwin even wrote Origin of the Species. Now, most places do not have a complete geologic column. Illinois does not. And in some places there's been erosion. Some places there never was any rock in the first place. But as in this rock cut, sometimes the layers are folded. And sometimes they're even heaved up on younger strata. But none of these facts invalidates using the geologic column for determining the relative age of fossils. And anyone who has taken an introductory college course in geology knows this. Do evolutionists construct the geologic column? No, it's field geologists, often those in the petroleum industry. And they often know little of evolution and could care less. Here is a geologic map of Kansas constructed by oil geologists. Well, the geologic column has contributed to what we know about horse evolution, and here is what Hovind has to say. He says, they have taken critters from all over the world, South America, Europe, and Asia, and put them together in a predetermined area. They have already decided to start off with the smallest to largest animals. That is not the way they are found. So what Hovind is suggesting here is that scientists are being purposely deceitful. And if that's true, why don't you come up with a list of specific scientists and exactly what fossils you think are out of order? Your English teachers back at EP High would have a heyday correcting your vague allegations. He continues, they find them in different layers, but they have it in the textbooks that the Eohippus slowly changes into Equus, the modern horse. That's baloney. The only baloney here is what Hovind has written, so much that you might consider a hot link to the Oscar Meyer website. Hoven clearly doesn't understand that horses don't change into other horses, but that species branch. And here's a slide showing most of the fossil forms associated with horse evolution. Hoven again says, modern horses are found in layers lower than the Eohippus. Eohippus, Equus. If there is a particular Eocene Equus fossil, I challenge Hoven to submit his findings to a reputable scientific journal. And finally, he says, the Eohippus is nothing more than the Hyrax running around South America today. Oh, really? The Hyrax is not a horse at all. It's not even in the same order. And it doesn't live in South America. It lives in Asia Minor, in Ethiopia, and was known in the Bible as a pony. Does this look like a horse to you? Sometimes ancestral traits show up in modern forms, as one sees in this three-toed horse. Well, Owen has a lot to say about feathers, too. 
Hovind does not know the difference between the chemical that gives carrots their color and the chemical that makes feathers and scales. In this uh, excerpt from his website, he calls carotin, carotin. A real scientist would know the difference between the two of these, and yet he wants you to believe that he knows something about feathers. Well, what about feathers? Hovind claims that there are no intermediate forms between feathers and scales, that feathers are very complex, that they came from different genes, and that no missing links have ever been found. Feathers look complex, but they're actually very simple serial repeats. And an interesting experiment lately is that by using a mutant form of an enzyme, scientists were actually able to induce the growth of feathers on chicken feet where scales normally would be found. There is that not, not that much difference between scales and feathers. There is also a perfect intermediate, Longisquama, a fossil form bearing the intermediates between scales and feathers, and this fossil form has been around for 30 years. But Hovind doesn't really want scales and feathers to be different because he doesn't want to see any transitions between birds, dinosaurs, and reptiles. He wants immutable kinds. And here's what he has to say. First of all, regarding the lung, reptiles have a sac-type lung, and birds have a tubular-type lung. This is correct, and this betrays their ancestry. Birds have a lung core and air sacs that get into even bones. The bones get attacked by these air sacs, and canals and holes are left. What other animals possess such features? Sauropod dinosaurs, theropod dinosaurs, and archaeopteryx. Very good example of a transitional form. What about the heart? He says reptiles have a three-chambered heart and birds have a four-chambered heart. Well, wrong again. A crocodilian, alligators and crocodiles, have four-chambered hearts. They are very different from that of a squamate, lizard and snake, and a turtle. This is exactly what one would expect if birds and crocodiles descended from a common ancestor. This is exactly what one would expect if birds and crocodiles descended from a common ancestor. Well, as you can see, all of these premises rely on feeding you an inaccurate picture of the science that really exists. So, why is the science so bad? Despite Hovind's claim of being a foremost authority, he has almost no science background at all. He claims to have a PhD from a place called Patriot University. Well, this is the uh, course listing from Patriot University, and interestingly, Patriot University does not offer a PhD. It does offer a doctorate of ministry in Christian education where one would be taking Old Testament, New Testament, Christian education, and some electives. Patriot University offers almost no science courses at all, the Bible and science, creation and the collapse of evolution, medical science and the Bible, the biblical basis of modern science, and a health, nutrition, and first aid course, but that's about it. And in order to matriculate at Patriot University, one sends in love offerings. I can imagine what kind of grades you get if you send in love offerings every month, and I sure wish I'd been able to pay my tuition that way. Patriot University is located in a house in Alamosa, Colorado. It used to be located in a house in Colorado Springs, and there is no outward evidence that this house is Patriot University. A website run by Christians who evaluate Christian distance learning centers calls PU a diploma role. So am I being elitist and snooty here? Well, no more than the rest of you. All of you have turned to professionals for medical or mechanical advice, and you assume a level of professional expertise. If you have a broken leg, do you want to get a doctor who graduated from U of I or one who learned medicine on his own? If you have a union card, did you get that by an apprenticeship or by workbooks at home study? Science is no different, and the practitioners of science also need to have a certain level of expertise, and this is most easily achieved by studying science at a university. 
Well, Hogan will now whine ad hominem or something like that. I'm not attacking him for his religious beliefs. It's the lousy science I'm after. Karen Bartelt here is uh, an, using an ad hominem argument, attacking me personally. Whether I have a degree or not is not the issue. Where my degree is from is not the issue. What am I saying is the issue. The, the university she teaches at is a small uh, college in Eureka, Illinois. I grew up not very far from that area. I'm very familiar with, the, with that region. And when President Reagan was there, it was a very, very small college, and yet their claim to fame is that it's the college of President Reagan. The size of the college doesn't matter. Darwin's degree was in theology, and yet I'm sure uh, Karen Bartelt and many others think of him as a being a great scientist. So to attack the college is simply uh, not a valid argument. By the way, my degree is a Ph.D., Doctor of Philosophy in Education, and we'll show you a picture of that. I'm sick of these archaic arguments being trotted out as proofs of a young earth or evidence against evolution. And if an atheist like Richard Dawkins went off the deep end and started spouting this stuff, I would be happy to come up here and slug it out with him. So let the questions begin. I'm ready. today, and I do uh, count it a great joy to be able to defend the biblical worldview <coughs> against anybody, uh, regardless of what they stand for, and I do uh, appreciate you all coming. My name is Kent Hovind. I did teach high school science 15 years. My degree is from Patriot University, a small non-accredited school, so this really ought to be very easy for Dr. Bartell to show how foolish I am in my scientific uh, uh, statements that I make. I mean, it should be a no contest thing, a David versus Goliath. I'm happy to be here for on those conditions. Let's talk about the geologic column. This was our first question. There's too many questions for me to answer in my 15 minutes, but we've got two hours over the day. We'll try to cover all this. In the early 1700s, or in the late 1700s, uh, most people thought the Earth was about 6,000 years old. That was called the paradigm, the accepted worldview. That was standard procedures from a textbook here. Along came James Hudson, who said he thinks the Earth is much older than that. And he wrote a book on that in 1795. James Hudson developed the idea that later came to be known as uniformitarianism. And the catchphrase there is, the present is the key to the past. Now, James Hutton's work had a very profound influence on a guy named Sir Charles Lyell. Charles Lyell was a lawyer from Scotland who, in 1830, wrote this book, Principles of Geology. In this book, building on the work of Strata Smith and Cuvier and some other guys, and she mentioned some, I, uh, see, I didn't get a chance to write them all down. I, Smith, I think, was the one you mentioned, uh, who were creationists. There's no question. But Cuvier and uh, some of these other guys, and Charles Lyell, over the early 1800s, developed the geologic column. Uh, Lyle's hatred for the Bible shows up on many pages in his book. I won't take time to go through all that, but he really did not like Scripture for all sorts of reasons. He talked about men of superior talent, he's referring to himself, who thought for themselves. In other words, you know, if you believe the Bible, you're dumb. And basically, the attitude is, we're smart, you're dumb. I run into this all the time, and we'll take care of that today. But he uh, said so they're blinded by authority, like the Bible. About 1830, Charles Lyell and some other guys developed a biostratigraphic technique for dating Cenozoic deposits based on relative proportions of living and extinct species of fossil mollusks. They did this, uh, they made this stratigraphy based upon the fossils they contained. This is from, uh, you can write the reference down there if you like, I'm as far as help, and check that out. Um, Geology Magazine. So it was Lyell, one of the questions you asked about Lyell, uh, based in the letters to me was, you know, how was Lyle involved in this developing of the geologic column? He was certainly involved in this developing of the geologic column. This is typical textbook propaganda showing the geologic column in this particular order. They have these different rock layers named, like, for instance, maybe you saw the movie Jurassic Park. The Jurassic layers, representing this right here, they, in the early 1800s, each of the layers of the Earth was given a name, an age, and an index fossil. And it was done, as you saw from the previous quote, based uh, largely, with a large section of it at least, based upon marine fossils. Because the largest percentage of the fossils found are marine fossils. The geologic column is the Bible to the evolutionist, and it can only be found in the textbooks. And I'll stand by my statement. If there were a column of sediments, unfortunately no such column exists. Now the 26 places she referred to, which I'll be glad to work on uh, referencing that, but let me show you how they tell the name of the strata that they're going to call it. Uh, that, that'll make, make a lot of sense to you of why they say they've been able to find 26 places. 
The Grand Canyon, for instance, has thousands of layers of sediment. They try to teach that each of these layers was laid down slowly over millions and millions of years, and the Grand Canyon represents millions of years of stratification and then subsequent erosion. What they don't tell you is, each of these layers of rock are stacked on top of each other like pancakes, and if they sat there for millions of years exposed, one of these intermediate ones would have some tremendous erosion marks in it. All of them should have all sorts of erosion marks in it. The Grand Canyon shows classic evidence of how these deposits were laid down very rapidly, probably within a few weeks or months of each other. Certainly not millions of years between the layers being stratified laid down. Secondly, the top of Grand Canyon is about a mile higher than the top of Grand Canyon. The river only runs through the bottom of the canyon, and the top of the canyon is also higher than where the river enters the canyon. There is no possible way the Colorado River made Grand Canyon. Rivers don't flow uphill. They would have to flow uphill for millions of years to cut the groove deep enough to flow downhill. They simply don't do that. Um, this geologic column is on display at many universities in almost every earth science textbook. This is really the way they, th this is their Bible. This is their paradigm, their worldview. Everything's interpreted based upon this geologic column. I was speaking in uh, South Dakota, and I went to the School of Mines where they have the large um, dinosaur display there. And the guy was showing us around, and he said, now ladies and gentlemen, these rock layers over here in the geologic column are about 70 million years old. My daughter was 12. She raised her hand. She said, how do you tell the age of the rock layers? And he said, well, we tell the age of the layers by the types of fossils they contain. They're called index fossils. She said, thank you, sir. We walked around the other side of this dinosaur. We're standing on the other side, and the guy said, now, look, folks, these bones right here are about 100 million years old. My daughter raised her hand again. She said, how do you tell the age of the fossils? He said, well, we tell the age of the fossils by which layer they come from. <laughs> she said, sir, when we were standing over there, you told me you knew the age of the layers by the fossils, and now you're telling me you know the age of the fossils by the layers. She said, isn't that circular reasoning? I mean, a 12-year-old can figure it out. It is classic circular reasoning. And that's exactly how they tell the age of these fossils and these rock layers. Let's see what the evolutionists themselves say about the geologic column and circular reasoning. Here's a textbook, Glencoe Biology 94 edition, on page 306. The layers of rock can be dated by the types of fossils they contain. You follow that? Very next page. Scientists have determined the relative times of appearance and disappearance of many kinds of organisms from the locations of their fossils in the sedimentary rock layers. <laughs> They're dating the fossils by the rocks, and on the next page before, they were dating the rocks by the fossils. Here's a quote. The intelligent layman has long suspected circular reasoning in the use of rocks to date fossils and fossils to date rocks. The geologist has never bothered to think of a good reply, feeling the explanations are not worth the trouble as long as the work brings results. German, American Journal of Science, 1976. You can check that out for yourself. Ever since William Smith, at the beginning of the 19th century, fossils have been, and still are, the best and most accurate method of dating and correlating the rocks in which they occur. Apart from very modern examples, which really are archaeology, I can think of no cases of radioactive decay being used to date fossils. They don't date those fossils by carbon dating, potassium argon dating, rubidium strontium dating, lead 208, lead 206, uranium 235, uranium 238. They date them by the position they're found in the rock layers. Paleontologists cannot operate this way. There is no simple way to look at a fossil and say how old it is unless you know the age of the rocks it comes from. And this poses something of a problem. If we date the rock by their fossil, how can we then turn around and talk about patterns of evolutionary change through time in the fossil record? Niles Eldridge, American Museum of Natural History, one of the biggest evolutionists there is. The rocks do date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. <laughs> Photography cannot avoid this kind of reasoning if it insists on using only temporal concepts because circularity is inherent, inherent in the derivation of time scales. American Journal of Science again. Circula circular reasoning is the all is what the evolutionary scale is based on. The charge of circular reasoning in stratigraphy can be handled in several ways. It can be ignored as not the proper concern of the public. In other words, it's none of your business. It can be denied by calling down the law of evolution. It can be admitted as a common practice, or it can be avoided by pragmatic reasoning. It ought to be admitted as a common practice. It's all based on circular reasoning. Are the authorities maintaining, on the one hand, that evolution is documented by geology, and on the other, that geology is documented by evolution? Isn't this a circular argument? Biologists help. 
Good name for the article. They need some help. It's all based on circular reasoning, folks. It cannot be denied that from a strictly philosophical standpoint, geologists are here arguing in a circle. The success of organisms has been determined by a study of their remains embedded in the rocks. And the relative ages of the rocks are determined by the remains of the organisms they contain. That's how it's done, folks. Encyclopedia Botanica. These aren't creationist uh, publications. This geologic column contains all sorts of different rock layers. We have limestone, sandstone, conglomerate, shale, etc. And they're scattered all through there. For instance, here we have limestone, limestone, limestone. If I handed a geologist a piece of limestone and said, how old is it? There is only one possible way he could tell, the age of the limestone. I mean, how do you tell the difference between 100 million year old Jurassic limestone and 600 million year old Cambrian limestone? It's limestone, and it's found all through the geologic column. How do you tell the age of this limestone? There's only one way it can be done, by the index fossils. They're digging the rocks by the fossils. So if they say they have found the geologic column in 26 locations, what she really means is they have found certain fossils in those 26 locations. That's how it was determined. And I would say in a worldwide flood in the days of Noah, you would find all sorts of fossils in all sorts of places. Radiometric dating would not have been feasible if the geologic column had not been erected first. Now what on earth do you mean by that, Mr. O'Rourke? You can't date things by, by radiometric dating unless you know the approximate age they come from. Go to any laboratory where they do carbon dating. I challenge you to do this. Take in a sample and ask them, would you please carbon date this? Get something like charcoal that's easy to, easier to carbon date, and they will make you fill out several pages of papers telling where did you find it, what fossils were associated with it, how old do you think it is? Look, carbon dating is not a blind test. They go into this very prime looking for a particular age, which is why the frozen dinosaur bones that were found in Antarctica were not carbon dated. They would have given some number, much less than the 70 million they're looking for. They'll say, well, because carbon dating only goes to 50,000 years. Well, we'll talk more about that later. I'll show you how carbon dating really works if you'd like to know. Here's an index fossil from a textbook. So the trilobite is an index fossil. If you find a trilobite in a rock layer, the rock layer was probably formed 500 million years ago. They date the layers by the fossils. That's how it's done universally. All this happened in the early 1800s for lots of political and scientific reasons, I'm sure. But we can talk about the politics behind this if you like. But here's a petrified uh, a fossil of a human shoe print with a, where a man stepped on a trilobite. William Meister found it in 1968. This is from Reader's Digest, Mysteries of the Unexplained, page 38. Another view of it, showing the trilobite uh, larger than that. It's all based on index fossils. Uh, let me see here. If you took this rock to any university and said, how old is this rock? They would say, oh, this is easy. This contains an index fossil. It's called a graptolite. And the graptolite is the index fossil for 410 million year old rock. It is the New York State fossil. Look it up in the encyclopedia, graptolites. Automatically, it'll say 410 million years old. That's what's been done for the last 150 years. Graptolites are one of the index fossils. But in 1993, they discovered graptolites are still alive in the South Pacific. First magazine, September 93. Well, if they're still alive, maybe they could be found in any rock layer. Hmm? There's indications there are some trilobites still alive in the deep Peruvian trench. Some of the deep research vessels have said, it looks like there might be trilobites down there. I don't know, it doesn't matter. The fact is, there's no such thing as an index fossil. But all of geology is built around these index fossils being in a particular order. So if you find a rock containing a trilobite on top of a mountain, it, well, it got there by an overthrust or something. They will figure out some way to explain how this 500 million year old rock is on top. Anything except the obvious, that maybe they just the fossils don't mean anything. But all of the geologic column is based on index fossils. Dinosaur blood found in bone. Medical pathologists examined dinosaur bone under a microscope and found blood, dinosaur blood, inside the bone. Earth Magazine, June 97. Now, how can blood survive for 70 million years? 18 million year old magnolia leaves from Idaho shale were still green when the rock was cracked open. Campbell is a far cry from a, a, a creationist. Fossil bees, 25 million years old, contain ancient germinating bacteria in their abdomens. 
I don't think so, folks. Those are not millions of years old. These petrified trees that are found standing straight up all over the world, they're called polystrata fossils, indicate the layers did not form slowly over millions of years. The layers formed rapidly before the trees could rot. I have seen scores of these things. Petrified trees running through multiple rock layers. Those rock layers are not different ages. Sometimes the petrified trees are upside down running through rock layers. I think the best explanation of this type of thing is a worldwide flood in the days of Noah, just like the Bible says, where you would get the earth covered with water. The earth is still spinning under the moon. The moon doesn't know there's a flood going on. So the moon is still pulling up on the water, causing the tides. But now you have a unique problem in a worldwide flood, because if the earth was totally covered by water, there would be no continents to stop the tides. I live in Florida. The tides wash up on the beach, and they wash back down. But if there were no continents to stop them, the tides would become harmonic. They reinforce each other after a while. And laboratory tests have indicated if the earth were covered by water, the tides would be 200 foot tidal change every six hours and 25 minutes. Well, I was up at the Bay of Fundy a few months ago and watched the tide come in 100 feet. And then the erosion is incredible along the edge of that place. Go to the Bay of Fundy in Canada and you'll see what I mean. I mean, that tide comes roaring in there. They put rubber rafts out there and you pay 10 bucks to get in the raft and you go surfing in front of the tide. You surf up river about 30 miles. Well, time? Okay. The uh, erosion from the moon, from the tides during the worldwide flood, would cause thousands and thousands of feet of sedimentation. That's why we have fossil layers. That's why we have layers containing zillions of dead things. It formed in a flood. The earth is, over, is speaking to us as loud as it can if there was a flood, the judgment of God, not millions of years of evolution. Thank you. My first question for Kent Hovind is, you describe a flood 4,400 years ago, an evolution of varieties from a single kind. With the degree of change that you imply in less than 1,000 years or so, why do you not consider yourself to be an evolutionist? Because whether you realize this or not, you're accepting a rate of change since the alleged flood that any real evolutionary biologist would find absurd. The rate of change uh, that Christians, uh, that creationists say, uh, happens is within the limits of the biblical kind. Charles Darwin, in 1859, sailed around the world and ended up, one of the places they stopped was the Galapagos Islands. Here in those islands, he saw 14 varieties of finches. He decided, after studying them carefully, by the way, he hated birds because he liked worms, and he thought it was kind of cruel for birds to eat worms, so he shot every bird he could find. And he collected all sorts of these birds, and Charles Darwin, said, I think all these birds had a common ancestor. I bet you're right, Charlie. It was a bird. <laughs> and then Charlie said later in his book, on page 170, in his book, Origin of Species, Charlie said, it is a truly wonderful fact that all animals and all plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other. So the birds and the bananas are related, according to Darwin. And I'm sure Dr. Bartell feels the same way if you go back far enough in time. Now here's the problem. What Charlie observed is what we sometimes call microevolution. Now I object to that term. We should call it variation, because it's not evolution at all. I wouldn't include that word evolution with it. It's a variety. Dogs produce a variety of dogs. No argument. Everybody agrees with that. Maybe even the wolf and the coyote and the dog had a common ancestor. No argument. That's a variation. It's a variety. Roses produce a variety of roses. See, this is what we call a fact. This is observable science. But what happens is, you get dogs, big dogs, and little dogs, but they're still a dog. Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. Nobody's ever seen a dog come from a non-dog. And a three-year-old can tell the difference between a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others, boys and girls? Well, duh. It's still the same kind of animal, okay? So the problem is, the Bible says they bring forth after their kind, not after their species. And Darwin got all been out of shape about species, origin of species. See, what the evolutionist wants you kids to do, they want to show you thousands of examples of microevolution, which is a fact. And then try to make you take a giant leap of faith and logic 
It's a belief that somehow that proves the dog and the wolf came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago. Well, look, macroevolution is religious. And when I say evolution is a religion, I'm referring to macroevolution. Now, here's the problem. When you say the word evolution, Dr. Bartell is thinking of thousands of examples of microevolution, and she doesn't understand how I can't see it. But I am thinking of macroevolution, and I don't understand how she can see it. So we're really speaking different languages here. It's because of the definition of the word evolution. It has two unrelated meanings. So from, from when, I, when I say the word evolution, I am not referring to microevolution. That is just a variation. It's still the same kind. And the varieties have limits. Farmers have been trying for years to get bigger and bigger pigs, but they'll never get a pig as big as Texas. There are limits to these variations. That's a fantasy. Okay. Uh, in one of Holman's website areas, he says that creationists say that variations have taken place since the flood, and he says the Eohippus is nothing more than the Hyrax running around South America today. So Kelvin is apparently saying that this type of change is consistent with microevolution and that it took place in the last thousand or so years. Next slide, please. However, the fossil record shows evidence of this much change in about four million years, and this is supposedly macroevolution, because creationists call apes and human beings different kinds. I wonder who is really the evolutionist here. I don't see a lot of difference. I didn't get time to get my uh, slides up. I'll get it for next time. On the horse evolution, which has been discredited many years ago by many experts in this field of horse evolution. You're supposed to ask me a question. A question now. I'm supposed to ask you a question. Yes. Okay. We'll start at the beginning of my list. Uh, where did time, space, matter, and energy come from? Hi. 29 black, please, first. First of all, uh, looking at his questions, most of these have very little to do with the theory of evolution. And this is another case of Hovind redefining things and setting up straw men. I don't believe in the theory of evolution. I provisionally accept the overwhelming evidence from anatomy, molecular biology, paleontology, and geography. Anyway, I'll give you a threefer. Where did the space for the universe come from, matter, and the laws? Well, what are laws? They're just descriptive generalizations. They don't have to come from anywhere. They work down to the earliest 10 to the minus 43 second of time, and that's good enough for me, because science does not deal with ultimate causes. Space and time are created as the universe expands, and some physicists propose some sort of huge virtual particle, which is a little out of my realm of expertise. However, a great discussion of this is by an evangelical Christian named Dr. Hugh Ross, and I would encourage you to pick up his book at the Berean Bookstore. It's a pretty neat example of creation ex nihilo, which Hovind supposedly espouses, and except for the time frame, it's consistent with Hovind's creation account. It's very improbable, but it only had to happen once, and we live in a world of improbable events. All of you is in our, are improbable events, when you consider the number of sperm, 50 million per cubic centimeter, that can fertilize an egg. And yet, here you are. Do I ask a question? One minute to respond. One minute to respond. Oh, okay. I have to follow the sequence here. I, I don't think you answered the question, uh, where did time, space, matter come from, except to beg the question and say, uh, we're here. Uh, if I understood what you said. Let me, let me see what, show you what the argument is. The word evolution not only has two different meanings when it comes to biological evolution. There are several other types of evolution. The evolutionist believes, and I can show you from hundreds of textbooks, if you'd like, we can show you all this, and I've got them with me in the computer, take me a minute to find it. The evolutionist believes 20 billion years ago, there was a big bang. Or some say 16, some say 18. Okay, the point is, a long time ago, there was a big bang. 
They do not tell us where the time, where the uh, space, where the matter came from. They also don't tell us where the energy came from. The whole idea behind a black hole is that you can get so much mass in one place that even light cannot escape. But if you have all the mass in the universe in one place, how could it explode? How could anything escape? Where did this mass come from? Where did the energy come from? Where did the laws come from? Then, they say 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cooled down and developed a hard rocky crust. And it ran down these rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion, 3 billion years ago. Time. That's religion. That's a fairy tale. Thank you. You say that the Earth's magnetic field was getting weaker with time, and that it was 20 times as strong in Adam and Eve's time. What is your evidence for this? Ever since uh, Gauss first measured the Earth's magnetic strength, uh, it has been observed that the magnetic field is getting weaker. Um, I don't know the numbers. I have them in a book. I can look them up for you if you want the precise numbers. But um, it's been observed the magnetic field is getting weaker. This was a problem. So what they, one of the things that was done was the Mid-Atlantic Ridge uh, magnometer was dragged across the ridge, and they noticed there were magnetic anomalies. Now, when it shows up in the textbook, it says there are magnetic reversals at the bottom of the ridge. This is absolutely a lie. There are no magnetic reversals at the bottom of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge or any place in the world. There is no place on the bottom of the ocean where a north-seeking compass will point south. There are places of stronger and weaker magnetism. So what happened was they noticed strong magnetism, weak magnetism, strong magnetism, weak magnetism, all pointed north. But they drew a line through the middle of this S-curve and said the ones below the line are south-seeking. Absolutely not true. There is no place on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge where a north-seeking compass will point south. I think there's a better explanation for why we have the weaker areas of magnetism at the bottom of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. I think that's one of the places where the fountains of the deep broke open during the flood, and the basalt bulged up and cracked. And hot basalt loses its magnetism. Cold basalt stores its magnetism. And so the water rushing into these cracks cooled off the basalt, and you have areas of strong magnetism, weak magnetism, strong magnetism, weak magnetism, indicating the cracks in the earth, but none of them are reversals. I defy anybody to show me one of those. So the magnetic field is declining. That's all we've observed. If the evolutionist wants to believe, and I'll give that a capital B because that's part of a religion, if they want to believe that this indicates the earth is billions of years old because they've reversed over time, I would challenge them to show me a place where they're reversed and show me a mechanism that could possibly reverse the magnetic field of the earth. What on earth could do that? It's never been observed. All we've seen is it's declining. I stand by the scientific evidence that indicates it's declining. It's probably not billions of years old. You can go on to the next one. I think you pretty much summarized that one up. Okay, the evidence of the Earth's magnetic dipole decaying is based on some pretty horrible measurements that uh, are extrapolated into an exponential graph when what they really fit is a straight line a lot better. These are the only actual measurements, and a guy named Thomas Barnes concocted a ridiculous uh, scale related to that. Next, please. The Earth's magnetic field is not a simple dipole. There are areas over the Earth where there are parts of high flux and parts of whole, um, areas of low flux. And no, we don't know exactly what causes everything uh, in the way of magnetic reversals, but there are plenty of areas where they've been documented. Here's what one of these striped areas looks like. Next, please. This is the remnant magnetism along the west coast of North America, and there are clear areas of regular and reverse polarity. And one more, I believe. The magnetic theory of Barnes. Okay, sorry. I guess I'll stay up and ask another question. In your section on dinosaurs, or are you, you're going to ask me one, right? It's your turn. I think I just heard you to say there are areas of reversed polarity on the bottom of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. No, I said the West Coast of North America. 
Okay, the rest, are there areas of reversed polarity? I said areas that show reversed polarity. Okay, there are no areas of reversed polarity off the coast of North America. There are areas of stronger magnetism and weaker magnetism. Go back and look at your own chart. Is this your question? It shows, uh, yes, where are these areas of reversed polarity? I would like to see one. Show me, show, tell me please. Put the remnant magnetism on back up. Oh, okay. Um, the question about the reverse polarity, why is that important? Well, did the Earth's magnetic field ever reverse or not? This gives a much longer age to the Earth, and I think that's the essence of the question. Now, these areas do show areas of, as he says, more magnetism or less magnetism. What's very interesting is that if you date along these, and I know you don't go with radiometric dating either, you get a consecutive youngest age right along the ridge and consecutive ages. This is the Juan de Fuca ridge. These are, I believe, potassium argon ages, and you can see very clearly zero here, two million here, four million in yellow, six million here, eight million in orange. And how interesting that we would get an effect like this if absolutely nothing is going on and radiometric dating doesn't work. Uh, the fact that you can point to a textbook that shows there these ages have been dated at so many million years old does not answer my question. Somebody decided the ages of these things, and it's interesting, you would say they're dated by potassium argon dating. I would certainly love to get into carbon dating or potassium argon, any type of dating, if you'd like. I was just in Hawaii a few weeks ago where they took uh, lava that was, they knew, erupted in 1803, and yet potassium argon dated at 2 billion years old. <laughs> living mollusk living shells are carbon dated at 2,300 years old. Freshly killed seal was carbon dated at 1,300 years old. Antarctic Journal, Volume 6. Shells from living snails are carbon dated at 27,000 years old. Science Magazine, Volume 224. One part of the Velasovich mammoth, carbon dated 29,000 years old. Another part was 44,000 years old. This is from the same mammoth. One part of Pima, a baby frozen mammoth, was 40,000 years old. Another part was 26,000 years old. And the wood immediately around the carcass was 9,000 years old. Uh, Unglaciated single, uh, from Geological Survey, professional paper, 862. The lower leg of the Fairbanks Creek Mammoth. Time. Are we? Are we? <laughs> In your section on dinosaurs, you state, and I quote, a plesiosaurus is a long necked swimming dinosaur. And you also say, Basilosaurus is a long, skinny dinosaur that looks like an alligator with two front feet and no back feet. Please give the audience the scientific reasons why you love a marine reptile and a whale in with the dinosaurs. Okay, the uh, word dinosaur was invented in 1841 by Richard Owen. And the word dinosaur comes from, I think, Greek and uh, Latin, if I believe it's a combination of the two, uh, meaning terrible lizard. That's what the word means. And so many dinosaur books that you can go to any library and pick up dinosaur books, and you will see plesiosaurs and basilosaurs and pterodactyls listed in books of dinosaurs. I think you're, uh, that would be a classic example of straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel if you want to say that my definition of a plesiosaur really should be a marine reptile instead of a dinosaur. Ask any kid in any school, show them a plesiosaur, say, what is it? Oh, a swimming dinosaur. I mean, so what? If it, it's a marine reptile, the point is, uh, it's a plesiosaur. And if it bothers you, I'm sorry. I'll try not to call it a dinosaur, though I think it's, though it's listed in most books of dinosaurs all across the world. I don't think it's a major point at all. Okay. Here are some slides showing some uh, transitional forms in whale evolution. This is the Stilosaurus, 40 million years, and Bilocetus, 52 million years. Notice the long functional back legs on the Bilocetus and the much shorter uh, legs on the Stilosaurus. Next, please. Other intermediate forms, uh, Rhodocetus from the Middle Eocene and the 
possible um, original form or the, the ancestor form of uh, whales. Next. This is whale evolution, at least as of a couple of months ago, where there are a large number of intermediate forms. And a couple of them that haven't even made it to the press yet. I think there might be one more. And occasionally we do see a whale that belies its evolutionary history by having contained in its blubber some sort of vestigial way. Give it for 30 more seconds. I don't mind. You got more stuff? No, I'm done. <laughs> Okay, the whale evolution. I don't know that I'll have time to get into all of this. I'd love to get into some of these. This is the next. I don't get to answer, respond to Hirsch about the whale. You just get up here and say people, whales evolved? No, but the format is that you ask the question. I thought we were supposed to have a discussion on the topic. No, Oh, you don't want a discussion on that topic? Not really. Oh, because I can show you about the whale evolution if you'd like. <laughs> You're simply wrong about that. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, you asked me to keep questions from my seminar notebook. I think you're 0 for 1 on the first one. Where did time, space, matter come from? If you want to stick with biology or with chemistry, which is uh, uh, your expertise here, can you explain to me how life got started from non-living material? Has anybody ever observed this happen? Is there any scientific evidence that it can happen other than Miller and Urey's experiments of making a few amino acids, which is a far cry from making life? which we'll be glad to talk about if you'd like. But uh, I'd like uh, what, what evidence you have of how life got started, and so this is corollary to the question, when, where, why, and how did this life learn to reproduce itself? How do you go from sexual, asexual to sexual reproduction? Those are two different questions in your seminar notebook, and I'll be happy to respond to the first one. Uh, grade 56, please. Any scientist should know that why questions are beyond the scope of science, so this is another straw man. We have a few problems in the origin of early life, and there is one chicken and egg problem. How do you get amino acids to polymerize? Well, you go for something that's a little bit easier to polymerize. And things like thioesters would have been abundant on a volcanic sulfurous early earth, and they polymerize without catalysts. Early catalysts might have been not pro or metals, not proteins. And what kind of evidence do we have of this? Iron sulfur proteins in our enzymes, evidence of an earlier time. And low expectations. You know, who said life had to be anything like we have now? Next, please. What is the probability of life just happening? Probably pretty poor, but there was a lot of molecular pre-adaptation. RNA can be a catalyst as well as a blueprint. And very primitive cells uh, could, have, could have been around without the sophisticated chemistry that we have today. Next, please. What about ATP? Hey, that's a complex chemical. Well, there are several organisms today that still use inorganic phosphate. That is also the source of high energy phosphate bonds. And that would have been very abundant on the early Earth. And a chemical fossil, the purple non-sulfur bacterium Rhodosporulium rubrum happens to use both ATP and inorganic phosphate. Next, please. What about information from energy? This is how energy is stored, poly A. What if there was an inclusion of a wrong base? Many bases and no replication. Then base pairing. Then replicative elongation. This is a plausible scenario. And last, please. A smaller, simpler genetic code. Fewer amino acids. If we repeat a design theorist calculation using only eight different amino acids and proteins 20 amino acids long, you can get a specific protein with a small pond's worth of bacteria. Uh, there might be one more. Yeah. And science has created, if, if your definition of life is that which evolves and reproduces, been there and done that, 1993. All right, textbooks say that 
first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. I mean, it just must have happened. We're here. That's the logic. First self-living cells emerged between 4 billion and 8 billion, 3.8 billion years ago. There is no record of this event. Biology textbook by Wadsworth. Have they produced life in the laboratory? Absolutely not. Not come anywhere close. Let me tell you what they did do. Miller and Urey both, and everybody, and Oprah and all these guys, have carefully excluded oxygen. They used what's called a reducing atmosphere. There's a reason they did this, because oxygen causes a problem. Oxygen will oxidize anything that is created. So they took oxygen out of their experiment for fear it would oxidize whatever was created. The problem is, without oxygen, you can't have ozone. And ozone blocks UV light. UV light is, uh, is what destroys ammonia. And uh, Miller and Urey used, uh, and uh, Stanley Miller and Urey and Oprah, and they used ammonia in their experiment. But ammonia is destroyed by UV light. So you have to have oxygen to protect it. Also, oxygen is found in the lowest rock layers. Michael Denton, page six, uh, 61. Time. Michael Denton, the far cry. That was a minute? <laughs> Find my videotape number four, and you'll have to answer all these. <laughs> Okay, in your section on genetics, you talk about numbers of chromosomes being related to complexity. I'd like you to know where you, or I'd like to know where you got the idea that the number of chromosomes is the sole measure of complexity. The uh, chart in my seminar notebook showing the complexity of animals based upon their chromosome number is a spoof on evolution, showing that how penicillin only has two chromosomes, fruit flies have eight, Tomatoes and houseflies both have 12. Uh, the number of chromosomes is, does not follow at all the expected evolutionary pattern. If your argument is that the length of the chromosome or something else in the chromosome is um, giving more information, I, I would point out that you're, uh, again, begging the question. The point, fact is they do have more chromosomes. The fern has 480 chromosomes. Man only has 46. Amoebas have 50. They have more chromosomes than we do. And we're supposed to have come from an amoeba. Uh, tobacco has 48. We keep evolving, we're going to be a tobacco plant. So the purpose of that was to show how silly the idea is. The only textbook I found that even dealt with the question of chromosome number was one biology textbook in a college library that I found that said the, evo the, the number of chromosomes does not seem to follow the expected evolutionary pattern. Then it said, therefore, we feel the evidence is irrelevant. Anything that happens to go against the evolution theory will be carefully excluded from the kids' education. They're not getting educated, they're getting indoctrinated into one world view. Now, if somebody wants to believe in evolution, that doesn't bother me. If they want to use my tax dollars to pay for my kids to have to learn that junk, that bothers me. They ought to go teach evolution. Whoever wants to pay and come learn it and get it out of our school system, macroevolution has nothing whatsoever to do with science. Nothing at all. Um, there is no correlation between evil, uh, the number of chromosomes and complexity. This is simply another whole man straw man argument. And I can't be responsible for the poor uh, things that have been said in, in biology books everywhere. Some of them are written rather poorly, and I think he's gotten most of them and gotten them up on his slides here. Zebras and horses have virtually the same DNA, but vastly numbers, vastly different numbers of chromosomes and the giant panda, the brown bear, and the spectacled bear, all different numbers of chromosomes. This is no big deal to a biologist. Do I respond or ask a question? Question. Question. I'd sure like to uh, respond to that one. Um, Questions are all listed in my seminar notebook. Uh, you can get on my website and order any of my stuff, and none of it's copyrighted. Feel free to do anything you'd like with it. Uh, well, let's see, let's pick one here. You never did answer the question, when, where, why, and how did life learn to reproduce itself? That was the second question. Tell me how reproduction got started from asexual reproduction. Or why would any organism want to reproduce itself? That's going to make more mouths to feed, increase competition. Looks to me like something they wouldn't want to do. Why, when, where, and how did they learn to do that? Now, 
Now you said that any plant or animal wouldn't want to reproduce more of its kind. How many kids do you have? Did you think about that when uh, you were having number three? The first cell capable of sexual reproducing. Well, there are a lot of uh, steps along the way. Bacteria conjugate, they exchange genetic material. And the best estimate of when sexual reproduction occurred, maybe a billion years ago, there seems to be a big diversification of protists at this time. All eukaryotes have the ability to undergo fusion or form diploid and fission via meiosis to form haploid cells. Yeasts have kind of a schizophrenic life as diploids or haploids. Amoebas, corals, aphids, strawberries all reproduce by fission. But sexual reproduction is a huge adaptive advantage. You get genetic variability and you might even get rid of maladaptive genes. Uh, mating doesn't control which genes of yours you pass along, but it sure does restrict those who contribute the uh, other half of the genes. And it's better to have some of your genes represented than none at all. Now as far as when, where, how, well, it's not that hard. You get information by way of energy. I had that up on the slide a minute ago. These systems have been produced in the lab since 1993. Stand by for Nobel Prizes. Do we know all of the steps? No. But do you know all of the steps in a historical sequence, such as each footstep Jesus took on his way to the cross? And if you don't know that, do you deny that the crucifixion occurred? Well, I'm glad you would bring up an example like that. Uh, I don't demand that my tax dollars be used for the crucifixion of Christ to be taught in the textbooks. So I think you're missing a major point here. Uh, if you want your evolution theory to be, which you said you don't know how it happened, okay, I can understand that. But yet, that's all you want taught in the school system at my expense as a taxpayer. Uh, here you are griping about uh, the creationist view when we're not using the taxpayer's dollars and you get paid every week from the taxpayer's funding at your university over there. Or at the no, school. no, actually I don't. Oh, it's not taxpayer. I mean, no. Eureka College is not? No. There are no tax dollars involved. That's right. Totally, well, good, thank you very much, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, if you were, like Stephen Gould or some of these guys taking taxpayer dollars to, to promote their religious worldview, uh, that, would, that certainly ought to be stopped. Same thing with universities and things like that. So you did not answer the question, other than to say, we're here, so it must have happened. You gave several examples, like yeast and bacteria conjugating. Giving examples of how certain species do this does not prove how it happened in history at all. So you did, did not at all answer the question. Now, uh, you know, I want some scientific proof. Time. Science deals with knowledge, what we know. Time. Tell me what you know about that. Well, you said you wanted to talk about carbon dating. Why don't you summarize your objections for the audience? It would be much easier if you would ask the questions in the order that I have the answers. Uh, <laughs> I cover carbon dating very thoroughly in my seminar notebook and on my website, drdino.com, and on videotape number seven of my series. I cannot give a one-minute answer to that question. Carbon dating, uh, two, I get three minutes. Well, if I had time to put up some slides, it'd be quicker. Carbon dating was invented 18, or 1950, 47 to 53 by Willard Libby, University of Chicago, later moved to Stanford. Uh, Willard Libby, made some fundamental assumptions which have since proven to be in error. He assumed that the Earth's atmosphere today was in equilibrium with the carbon. Uh, it's a little complex. I explained it with lots of pictures on my video number seven, but the sunlight produces carbon-14 in the atmosphere. Then it begins to decay or fall apart. The normal half-life is about 5,730 years. So as it's being produced, at the same time, it's being destroyed. It's a similar analogy to trying to fill a barrel with water if there's holes in the barrel. Pretty soon, you're going to be filling it, and it's going to be leaking at the same speed, and you reach a point called equilibrium, where the, you'll never fill the barrel. Well, the Earth's atmosphere is, carbon-14 is being formed in the atmosphere by the sun, by radiation, and it's being destroyed by normal C14 decay. The equilibrium point, Libby and others decided, if you took a brand new planet Earth, stuck it out in the solar system, it would take about 30,000 years to reach equilibrium it still is not in equilibrium. There is more carbon-14 today than there was yesterday. The carbon-14 in the atmosphere is still increasing, which means the Earth is not even 30,000 years old yet, which I could have told them just from reading the Bible. And 
the dating that they used, that carbon dating, which I showed you the examples of how they get wild examples from the same animal, but they only accept the ones that fit the geologic column. Dating is really done by the geologic position. It is not done by carbon dating. The objections I have to carbon dating are it's based on several fundamental assumptions. They're assuming that the rate of decay has remained constant all through history. We don't know that. They tested it for a few days in the laboratory. They're assuming there's been no contamination of this sample. They're assuming you can somehow know how much was in this object when it was alive. But if C14 is still increasing in the atmosphere, the animals that lived a thousand years ago had less C14 than we do today, which means they would automatically carbon date much older than they should because you have a rubber ruler to measure them with. And without taking 30 minutes to give a thorough explanation, uh, that's the best I'll have to do on that, but read my seminar notebook or videotape number seven, or uh, give you any number of sources on carbon dating and how it's based on several simple fundamental assumptions, which simply are not provable. And there, isn't, there aren't any things dated in the geologic column by carbon dating or potassium argon or uranium lead or iridium strontium. It's all dated by geologic position, which is based on the assumption that evolution has happened, which is not true. This is your carbon uh, dating thing? That's an older one, sure. Well, that was the one I got out of your seminar notebook. Okay, what you have here is uh, someone who says that carbon dating is only good back to 3100 BC. That's very interesting since it has been calibrated using bars. Next slide, please. And keep going, going past that one. Um, Hogan doesn't like barbs either, but there's an obvious difference between regular barbs and storm barbs. Next, please. And this is what I was wanting to get to, the VAR count, counting the number of VARs versus the carbon-14 age going back 12,000 years, and now a chronology unbroken back to about 45,000 years. Is the amount of carbon uh, constant? Is it made in a constant uh, amount? No. But there are correction curves. Next. Time. Well, let's see. I think you're over two. You didn't explain where uh, life got started. You didn't explain how life learned to reproduce itself. Let's try a third one here. Um, natural selection only works with information that is already present. For instance, cows have the information to produce a leg, and sometimes they produce one in the wrong spot. A five-legged cow is born. But they don't ever produce a feather or a wing or a beak because the information is not there to produce something like a feather on a cow. The so how can natural selection, working with information already present, produce something new? as opposed to uh, keeping the species or kind or whatever just simply to be a strong, healthy species. I don't see how you can get something new. How do you get a higher progressive, a higher life form from natural selection or mutations? Or, you know, explain how this works, please. How do you get a higher life form? What number is that? Uh, number 12. Natural selection only works with genetic information available and tends to keep species stable. No problem. Okay, no problem. Good. This is a good question. Genes sometimes duplicate and perform new functions. You have genes for color vision in your eyes, except some of you males who have kind of not so good color vision genes. And these all can be traced back to a time when there were fewer types of color genes available. One good example of a new uh, function this is uh, gray 67, already. Okay. Would be to look at the color genes that are present in monkeys. Now, if a designer designed them, one would think that, well, yeah, they should have about the same kind of color vision because they're doing their monkey things and they're in the jungle and they're eating fruits of different colors. But if we look, the New World monkeys, the apes, and humans all have color genes that are very much the same. The, uh, the New World monkeys have color genes that are much less uh, developed. They can't see colors as well as we can. 
Uh, why? Because colored genes have evolved from rhodopsin, which is a black and white gene, to give blue cones, green cones, and red cones. The molecular data for this is pretty much indisputable. So this is one gene doing a new function. This is natural selection. Um, this is certainly a new variety, and I think that color vision is a little more complex than black and white vision. You can see the same thing if you look at digestive enzymes and blood proteins. Um, um, your example that you gave of the monkeys having different uh, color vision certainly could be an example of loss of information not necessarily gain of information. It appears to me like your evolutionary prejudice has led you to interpret any evidence as evidence for evolution. Where it certainly could be that uh, there's been a loss of genetic information. You assume because one can see three colors and one can see two colors, the one that has three has evolved higher than the one that had two. Maybe they both had three at the beginning and one lost it for some reason. Darwin was certainly confused about the eye. He said, I suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection. It seems absurd. And I'll be glad to mention your letter about talking about the entire quote. I'd certainly be glad to do that. I forgot, I left the book at the church, but I've got it tonight if you want to see that. Um, the eye is incredibly complex. Textbook says it formed over millions of years. I resent that. This textbook says you can better understand how the eye might have evolved if you can picture a series of changes. And what you just gave us was an imaginary picture of how it might have happened. That's not science. In your seminar notebook, or at least in your website, you connect uh, Darwin to a lot of racist tendencies. While we're talking about racism, what is the origin of the Southern Baptist denomination? I have no idea. I am an independent, temperamental, fundamental Baptist. I am not a Southern Baptist. I don't know. Well then, before we blame racism on Darwinism, perhaps you'd like to hear the following quotes from Richard Furman, president of the SBC in 1822. The right of holding slaves is clearly established in the Holy Scriptures, both by precept and example. Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist, for all the slaveholders with whom I have ever met, the religious slaveholders are the worst. And after the end of the Civil War, Southern Methodists, Southern Baptists, and Southern ba Presbyterians I'll continue to denounce emancipation as contrary to the will of God, and none of them will acknowledge, nor do many even remember, that their religion arose from a theological defense of slavery. And finally, in 1960, Bob Jones, if you are against segregation and against racial separation, then you are against God Almighty. No nation has ever prospered or been blessed like the colored people in the South. So there's plenty of blame to pass around. Don't lump it on Darwin. I respond to that? Question. Question. Well, let's see. I'm still not Southern Baptist. Uh, that's all you quoted. Um, <coughs> question. I asked you a second ago uh, how natural selection could produce something new. Yeah, I don't believe you answered that. I have to go back and watch the tape, see if I understand all that. But that, by my count, would put you out at 0 for 3. Um, is it possible? The similarities in design that we observe, this is question number 11, between different animals prove a common creator instead of a common ancestor. Every time you see a biology textbook showing some similarities of design like the forelimb of the animals or well, anything, they always attribute it as proof for evolution. What is wrong with the creationist position that says God created the animals and plants and they bring forth after their kind and the common designer used a common theme, like Ford makes four tires on most of their vehicles because it's a good theme that works. Common designer argument. Ready? Okay. Uh, it's possible, but not likely. If you want to posit a designer, posit a bad designer. This is a flounder, and it starts out as a nice symmetrical fish and ends up 
with its eyes being mushed all over on one side. That's, that's terrific design. Next, please. This is choking. This is another example of great design. Our air passages and food passages cross in the back of the throat. This is a designer who plans, apparently, on 60,000 people a year dying of tracheal obstruction. And this is a designer who will create snoring and apnea in us older folks. Next, please. Snakes can do it just fine. So good design is possible. Next. And here's one for all you guys. This is the male reproductive system. The epitome of bad design. All of you 50 years and up are going to be coping with the fact that one day your prostate gland, poorly designed because it's got tubes running through it, is going to enlarge. This prostate gland is going to push back on the urinary bladder and you're going to go get a prostate operation. That is really the ultimate of great design, wouldn't you say? Next, please. Um, design spills over into uh, is someone a, a female or a male. And sometimes things go wrong because we are designed with both female and male systems in our bodies as embryos. Here's an example of something that can go wrong in design. These are four brothers. They had androgen insufficiency because their testosterone was unable to park anywhere in their bodies. They went on and developed the default or female body. So yeah, I'm all for you know great design, and I haven't even started to talk about bad backs or giving birth or anything like that. If you could go back to 64, please, Bob. If we take time to consider biology, we come up with a bumbling and frivolous god. Organisms show stupid mistakes, dysfunctional design features, and odd arrangements and funny solutions are proofs of evolution. I am very baffled by how the concept of bad design can be evidence against creation. I would like to see you invent a machine as a computer program. Let's just take a computer program. You get a program that can make a copy of itself, and then that copy make a copy of itself, and then that copy make a copy of itself, after the 50,000th copy, and it still runs. I would say the original copy was a really good design. Yeah. Now, I don't know what Adam was like. He lived to be 930, according to the Bible, and I doubt that he had prostate trouble. I think prostate trouble is a, is a nutritional deficiency. You can't blame right. that on bad design. Right. I think an awful lot of people past 50 do not have prostate trouble, and I think you can talk to any nutritionist and find out it's pretty simple to prevent that from happening. Yeah. That's like finding a smashed car and saying, wow, look at his bad design. Well, it's got it in the rack. Okay? So I think the design that we see is just very obvious in nature. I've had evolutionists tell me the eye is poorly designed because the blood vessels are in front. Well, we need them in front to block the UV light. I'd be glad to talk about that sometime. No, poor design is not proof of evolution. One third of men will develop prostate trouble. Um, why don't you give some evidence that shows that the layer of dust on the moon proves the moon is less than 10,000 years old? I didn't get, did, get, did not get time to make a slide on this, though I have the evidence. Here is a book which we have in our ministry uh, in the beginning by Walt Brown with a very extensive section about the testing of the dust on the moon. That was one of the arguments you brought up. Uh, Isaac Asimov said, I get a picture, therefore, of the first spaceship picking, up, picking out a nice level place for landing uh, purposes, coming in slowly downward, tail first, and sinking majestically out of sight. Isaac Asimov, 14 million tons of dust per year, Science Digest, 1959, before they went to the moon. 1956, uh, Raymond Littleton in The Modern Universe, from New York, uh, Harper and Brat Brothers, said Littleton felt that the dust formed by only the erosion of ex exposed moon rocks by ultraviolet light and x-rays could, during the age of the moon, be sufficient to form a layer over it several miles deep of dust. So Littleton predicted in 1956. 
Thomas Gold proposed that thick layers of dust accumulate in the lunar maria. The lunar surface, again, from monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society of London, 1955. I can go on and on with quotes, but as far as the amount of moon dust that does come in, there's a very technical journal here, uh, the technical notes on the moon dust, how much has been measured, and I'll be glad to make a copy and send this to you. Uh, I, I should have thought of that ahead of time. It's been a busy week. Uh, but uh, Herbert Zook of NASA was the man from uh, U.S. Uh, National Aeronautics and Space Administration had been intimately involved in estimating the thickness of the dust layer on the moon before the first Apollo moon landing. He helped analyze the lunar material brought back from the moon. Of the many interesting things he told me and sent me by mail, one is critical in answering the above question. NASA did not realize until the moon and dust rocks were analyzed that only one part in 67, 1.5%, of the debris of the moon came from outer space. The rest was pulverized moon rock. So 1% comes from outer space. So you've got an even more serious problem if the dust layer was only about a half inch thick. And you can listen to the entire conversation available from NASA, or I've got it at home, of the guys when they landed on the moon, the first hour and a half conversation. A lot of the conversation was about, where's all the dust? I talked to the man who created the backpack that Armstrong was carrying. He said, Mr. Hoven, he lives in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. He said, I was instructed to make the backpack dustproof because NASA still seriously was worried about him sinking into the dust. They thought it would be a serious problem. You can take a look at the pictures and see the large lunar modules. What happened in 1972, after they'd been to the moon quite a few times, somebody revised the calculations of how much dust should be accumulating on the moon. But the technical notes I have here, which would take a long time to uh, go through, indicate in 4.6 billion years, figuring in a factor of 67 to 1, which is the amount that's actually found there, the dust layer would be 1,033 feet deep if the moon were, and I'll be glad to send you all this stuff. If you'd like this, this book's available. And if it's not much just copyrighted, you can copy it and send it back. Get your money back and I'll have the book. Thank you. Well, I have your quotation out of your seminar notebook, at least part of it. You talk about a 1954 measurement, and I don't know where you got the other ones or what they were doing. Um, we did have a space program in between time. The typical citation is from a 1960 paper of... Uh, dust coming on uh, Mauna Kea or something like that. Now, if you can flip to the next one, the real rate of dust accumulation is way lower than that. And the upper limit on the amount of dust would have been possibly in the area of 10 centimeters high. You find one of, like you said, 1.5% space dust plus the regolith no more than 15 centimeters high. I'm sure going to the moon was a very traumatic thing, and the astronauts were probably worried about a lot of stuff, but do you seriously think that we would have sent someone to the moon if they had been able, uh, thought to have had to cope with 500 or 1,000 feet of dust? It just doesn't make any sense. Um, I will certainly send you those quotes and you can deal with uh, those people who say, what you gave, here's an example that you said might give 10 centimeters of dust, which is about three inches, was only, if you call her slide back up there, could you do that, the one you just had? I don't get to discuss this one? She only gave one dust particle size. There's lots of sizes coming into the room. Anyway, well, let's see. All my questions have to come from my notebook. Um, Let's see. Could you please explain, question 13, when, where, why, and how did single-celled plants become multi-celled? And where are the two-celled or three-celled or four-celled organisms in the world? Why do we have nothing that is two-celled? We go from single-celled to multi-celled. How did they make this jump, please? Uh, that's pretty easy. Volvox, gonium. Gonium has four or more cells. There's no specialization. Volvox has hundreds of cells embedded in jelly. Some are modified for reproduction. If you're looking for intermediate forms, these are two perfect intermediate forms that happen to still be around. Um, 
When did they go to multicellular? Well, there's evidence in the fossil record of multicellular algae about 800 million years. I don't know what the big deal is about having two of them. I've got four of them right here. In one billion to 700 million year old rocks in uh, China, Norway, India, and Canada, we find these multicellular algae. The first land plants, 450 million years ago. The first vascular plants, 408 million years ago. There is a progression of plants as well as animals. What you gave was an example of a colony or several cells working together. We have the same thing here in a city with several people working together, some doing different jobs. That is not an answer to the question of how did it evolve. Finding something in a rock layer, we still have these creatures that you showed on the screen alive today. They're still here. So finding them in a fossil record, which I think I showed you pretty clearly, the fossil record is based on circular reasoning, is not evidence at all. And that finding them in a colony, several cells working together for a common good, is still not the same thing as a tissue or an organism. So I think you did not answer that question at all as far as how single-celled creatures became multicellular. Because there is no answer to this, as any biologist who understands their stuff will tell you. We don't know. We think it happened because we're here. But that's not science. That is religion, which is my whole point. It's all based on something you have to believe. You think it happened? You're welcome to think that. But nobody should be allowed to use taxpayer dollars to spread that kind of propaganda in our school system. That's not, that's not science. Am I supposed to ask a question? Um, your information concerning measurements of stellar distances is outdated, to say the least. What is your basis for restricting parallax measurements to only, I believe you said, 20 to 100 light years, and possibly ignoring all the other types of distance measurements completely? Uh, the way star distances are measured, I cover pretty thoroughly on my question-answer tape number seven. I don't have time to give you all the details on that now. But to measure star distance, uh, you have to have two observation points if you want to measure it with parallax. And it appears to me like, by your question, you are admitting that they really only can measure through parallax distances, trigonometry, a short distance. Maybe 20 light years. Some textbooks say 100. That's a stretch. And I've got the actual measurements in my uh, seminar notebook, or I can show you pictures of that if we have time. But uh, if you have two observation points on opposite sides of the sun, opposite sides of Earth's orbit around the sun, is 16 light minutes across. Now how you could tell in June where you used to be in January across the orbit of the sun, how you can tell that precisely, I find well, to be a big question. I don't think you can tell exactly where you were six months ago on opposite side of the sun. But even assuming you can, you're 16 light minutes apart. One light year is 525,926 minutes, I believe. A little over half a million minutes in one year. So if you're going to take a triangle that is 16 inches from point A to point B, point C that you're going to try to measure to is eight and a quarter miles away. You get me two surveyors to set their transits up 16 inches away from each other, focus on a dot eight and a quarter miles away, and tell me the precise angle. That's for one light year, assuming you can know where you were six months ago going around the sun. I don't think any of that's possible. All, all the folks who understand parallax trigonometry will say it's only good for even 20 light years, I think, is a stretch. The fact is we don't know the distances to the stars. Now, if you want to use luminosity or red shift or Cepheid variables as your evidence that they're billions of light years away, we can certainly talk about that, but not in the time constraints we have here. There's lots of folks who will simply say, we don't know the distances to the stars. We think they're pretty far. Which, another problem is if you're going to use uh, red shift, for instance, as an uh, example of t telling the distance to a star, because we see the light, the red in the spectrum shifted away from the other colors, does not prove it's traveled great distances, or that the star is great distance away. The whole idea behind a black hole is that light can be attracted by gravitational forces. So therefore, the light cannot escape from the black hole. And if the starlight is traveling through space, going past all sorts of different gravitational fields, we don't know what's going to happen to it. We know that light traveling through glass can be bent. You can get the rainbow on a piece of glass right here on the, in the, on the desk if we had a, a light in the rain, uh, prism. And so light is bent. Different colors travel different speeds. The red bends farther because it's a longer wavelength. And so the, the red shift, the Cepheid variables, which one particularly you want to talk about, none of those prove 
The stars are billions of light years away. I happen to believe they are. Don't say that I don't believe this universe is as big as it probably is, probably much bigger than we can comprehend. But instead of saying, that proves evolution, I say, wow, that proves we've got a big God and he's yeah. worthy of worship. Yeah. Well, Kent Hovind, arguing from uh, personal incredulity doesn't mean that astronomers don't have a pretty good idea of how far away stars are. He's talking about the limits of parallax, and yes, for Earth-based observations, about 300 light years. Uh, technology, the same thing that's giving you your computer there. We have 1,500 light years possible from Hipparchos, and up to, it's about 10,000 right now, 15,000 light years with the VLBA system. There are other ways of measuring distances to the stars as well, but I wonder why we're you know, stuck back in the 1800s. You also, it looks appears to me, are assuming the speed of light has always been consistent, uh, or that the speed of light even now travels at the same speed uh, in all parts of space, which we have quasars putting out things that are about uh, ten times faster than the speed of light. So I, I would get into that if you'd like. That's a little more. Okay. Um, I would like to discuss with you a little bit about the origin of life again, if you would. Uh, being a, uh, what was your title? A PhD in organic chemistry. Can you explain how uh, amino acids formed into proteins? The simplest protein that we see is 70 to 100 of these amino acids. They all have to be in precise order. And what we saw from Miller and Urey's experiment was half of his amino acids were right-handed, half were left-handed. If you're going to drop letters of the alphabet on the floor, and you've got to get 70 of them in order and all right-handed or all left-handed, how's that going to happen? What's the probability against that out of the 20 amino acids that we have? Is, well, it's not on my list. Is that going to be a no, taboo no. question? Okay. I want to know about how life, uh, how you go from amino acids formed in the laboratory to even a simple protein. How did this happen? 55 grams. You open up a can of primordial soup, I guess. Um, what you really do, and if you could go to the next slide, he wants to know how amino acids polymerize. And like I said, this is kind of a problem because the amino acids right here are not terribly reactive. They don't polymerize in water. So yes, you do have a kind of a problem. However, you're proposing that there were amino acids present on the early Earth. It's much more likely with volcanoes that there were thioesters present on the early Earth instead. These polymerize in water. You also have the possibility that metals can do the polymerizing, and which I didn't, I didn't get much of a chance to get to. This low expectations. I don't really care if I have a, an average size protein today that's 70 amino acids. What if the proteins and the conserved uh, Reactive sites of proteins are usually quite small, 20 or 30 amino acids. And you don't have to have a particular sequence. If you look at your insulin, cow insulin, bat insulin, the sequences aren't the same. There are a variety of uh, amino acid sequences that will get you the same type of catalysis. So this is another straw man argument. You can have a smaller protein, do a function, you can have the amino acids coming together very easily under conditions that were present on the early Earth. So, uh, what's the big deal? Uh, it be interesting to replay the tape. I forgot to make a quick count of how many times you said could have or might have. That's what science says. Well, that sounds to me like your religion. You believe it might have happened, it could have happened. There's no scientific evidence that it did happen. What Miller would have, uh, these guys were able to do, they were able to make a few amino acids. What they don't tell you in the textbooks, which they ought to tell you, are the problems with this experiment. 
What he actually made was 85% tar, 13% carboxylic acid, both of which are destructive to life. He made 2% amino acids. Out of the 2% that he made, he made mostly just two amino acids, and there are 20 required for life. And the amino acids that he made bond much quicker with tar and carboxylic acid than they do with each other. They don't tell you about that, and I think they ought to tell kids this stuff in school. What they don't tell you is that amino acids are kind of like letters of the alphabet, which make words, which make paragraphs, which make books. To make a few letters of the alphabet is a far cry from making a book by random chance from an explosion in a print shop. Half what you made were left-handed and half were right-handed. Smallest proteins do have 70 to 100. You said, well, you have low expectations. Maybe it was only 20. That's your religion. It's not, the smallest one today is 70 to 100. Don't tell me you might go by with 20. In your section on In the Beginning, you state that the Bible verses all tell when the beginning was. I was unable to find any of them that do. Which of these verses is actually supposed to, as you say, tell when the beginning was? Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 19, 4, and in Mark 10, 6, He which made them at the beginning made them male and female. So it appears to me from that verse that Jesus is saying, when God created them male and female, that's when the beginning was. So that's pretty clear from those verses. Uh, the Bible talks about uh, Satan was a liar from the beginning. And if you read the book of Genesis, you can see when Satan lied. It was after Adam was created. So I think the creation week, as spelled out in the Bible, was the beginning. Jesus said, all the blood of righteous Abel, from the, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zacharias the prophet shall be required of this generation, indicating Abel was the first one killed, which is right what the Bible says. And yet uh, the Bible says in Romans uh, 5 and in 1 Corinthians 15, there was no death until Adam sinned. And so if the first death was the death of Abel, which is uh, what the Bible teaches, as far as the first human death, then that was the beginning. So I think a, a, an honest, open-minded reading of those verses will indicate the Bible does teach the beginning was about 6,000 years ago just from adding up the dates given in Scripture. I wouldn't put an exact date on it, but I'd say within a few hundred, a few, maybe a thousand years of that is certainly reasonable. So those are the verses. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. Was Jesus lying? There are many ways of trying to reconcile religion and science, and the creationism movement is not a monolithic uh, group of people. There are quick creationists who believe in a young earth, progressive creationists who believe in an old earth, and gradual creationists. This is a quotation from William Bell Riley. Uh, many of you will, might recognize this guy's name. This is a person whose church Billy Graham took over, and this will give you an idea of the lack of consensus on the age of the earth that was prevalent among fundamentalists in the 1920s. Even if evolution is only a scientific theory of interpretation posing a scientific fact, as the creationists argue, creationism is only a religious theory of biblical interpretation posing as biblical fact. And finally, this is a uh, religious physicist, Paul Davies, winner of the 1995 Templeton Prize. The last question. Um, you mentioned on your previous slide there that the young earth, uh, I think they called it, I didn't get a chance to write it all down, that they reject much evidence. If you want to call her about last slide back up, the first one she used in that last section, whatever number that was. Uh, what scientific evidence am I rejecting uh, with the young earth, literal, biblical, creationist position? Uh, the slide said that the you know, people, which put me in that category, young earth creationists, reject, there it is, they reject much physical and biological science. 
Would you please show me what physical or biological science I have rejected? I taught both of those subjects and love them dearly, and there is much about science that I really enjoy. I just object to evolution being mixed in with it because it is a pagan religion, unworthy of anybody's waste of time to study that. I like science, and I'd like to see what I've rejected, please. Well, that's not one of your questions, but that's okay. Um, if you could go to gray 18. We'll start there. You've totally misrepresented the concept of index fossils in the geologic column. There are numerous areas of the world where igneous rocks are dated, and the geologic column was originally put together by the succession of the layers. Ever since the discovery of radiometric dating in the 1900s, parts at least of all of the layers have been dated. And what we've got here is layers of volcanic ash. These happen to be in Lake Turkana. And this volcanic ash dates to 1.2 to 1.3 billion million years. This one, 1.4 to 1.5 million. This one, 1. Um, 6 to 1.8 million years, and this one 2.2 million. You totally reject the science of radiometric dating for starters. Um, let's see, you haul in the Miller-Urey experiment and totally ignore the fact that there have been 40 or 50 now more years of experiments that support this prebiotic Earth. You um, talked about oxygen being present in the early Earth. What you didn't tell them was that it was probably, if it was there at all, it was a very small percent, and that the early Earth's atmosphere was indeed quite a reducing atmosphere, and you can tell this from the minerals. Um, let's see. Um, rejected carbon-14 dating and its uh, uh, correlation with barbs. You don't believe that barbs are real. Transitional forms. I would challenge anyone who's interested in the topic to read the very last chapter of the book called Bones of Contention by Marvin Lubinow. Uh, who has a very extensive chapter just about the KBS tub, named after K. Brennemeyer, something like that, Brennemeyer, whatever her name was. The KBS tub was for many years radiometrically dated at 260 million years old until Richard Leakey found a skull, a perfectly normal human skull, a skull ER 1470, was found under the KBS tub. And there's quite an interesting story of how the KBS tub was redated when many, many people had dated the KBS tuft at 260 million years old until that skull was found. Now, if you really want to know the truth about how these layers are dated, I would challenge you to read that last chapter and refute what he says, Marvin Lubinow says in that chapter. I will send you the book if you promise to read that chapter only. Bones of Contention. That book deals with all of the so-called cavemen that have been found. They have all been discredited. Their hoaxes or frauds are misidentified. Black for you. We're, we're close. That's okay. 
Okay, um, this is not a science versus religion issue. Many of the citations used today have come from evangelical Christians, often former young earth creationists who did pursue degrees in science. Please visit their websites and read their articles on the Orange Bibliography sheet. About a week ago on WJBC, Kent Hovind made the point that there are literally thousands of scientists who are creationists. And in the vaguest sense of the word, I suppose that's true. He mentioned Michael Behe, author of Darwin's Black Box, as an example. Behe is an intelligent design theorist who is clearly an old earther and comfortable with some aspects of evolution. This only underscores the fact that there are many ways of reconciling science and religion. There is no monolithic creationism movement, and even other young earthers disagree with a lot of what Hovind has to say. Gerald Larsma of the ICR says the tree ring dating validates carbon-14 dating. The moon dust argument for a young cosmos is no longer useful. Austin of the ICR, there is evidence for the geologic column. Humphreys, reversals of the Earth's magnetic field do occur. And de Young and Rush, there's no evidence that the sun is shrinking. Next. Glenn Morton runs an excellent website, and I would encourage you to visit it. He published 27 articles for the Creation Research Society Quarterly, and Ghost wrote as part of Josh McDowell's book. He said, the data I was seeing at work was not agreeing with what I had been taught as a Christian. Eventually, my doubts about the reliability grew so large that I was driven to the edge of becoming an atheist. Next, please. Roger Weems is also an important site to visit. Radiometric dating from a Christian perspective. This excellent review article describes over 40 techniques that they present a coherent picture of an earth formed a very long time ago that Bible-believing Christians are among those involved in radiometric dating and his paper refutes some of the misconceptions prevalent among Christians today. There are four others, and I'm going to go over them real quick. Um, a church builder in the Soviet Union said that he found the evidence for a young earth crumble in the face of evidence, that there are many scientific errors. A geologist, the evidence for an old earth became overwhelming after he took a geology class. And Steve Robertson, who wrote a monograph on the pointing Robertson effect. I'm sad to say that I'm one of those college graduates who has had a severe crisis of faith as a result of their ministry. And finally, most of what was written in all those ICR pamphlets I have been reading was nonsense. My faith never recovered. What is the real purpose of creation science material? Not to discover anything new, that's for sure. It's kind of like watching Star Trek. Beam me up, Scotty. We're in warp drive. Jean-Luc, the dilithium crystals are critical. It kind of sounds like science. And the techno babble of creation science is meant to give people who have already suspended their belief the impression that there really is some science associated with what they believe in. It sounds scientific, and obviously most people won't bother to check the accuracy of the statements. Instead, lapping this stuff up, carotene and hyraxes, conspiracy theories concerning the geologic column, and shrinking suns, and all. Learn some real science. Don't swallow this. Make up your own minds about science and religion once you have some accurate information. Thank you. Well, I do certainly want to thank you for coming. I, I can't tell you how hard it is to find an opponent for an abate like this. I have a long-time standing offer of $10,000 to anybody with any scientific evidence for evolution. Empirical evidence. I would like to see some. I think what we've seen today is a lot of could have, might have, hope so, which is what all we see ever in the evolution. As far as scientific evidence, um, I think the subject of origins is probably inherently outside the field of science. It's something we're going to have to take by faith. But the, the idea that... Getting all the molecules together in one place in a prebiotic soup is somehow going to produce life. If that's really what you believe, I would challenge you to put a frog in a blender and turn it on. <laughs> you have all the molecules to make a frog all in one place. Let it run for millions of years to see how long it takes to produce your frog. The textbook says humans evolved from bacteria four billion years ago. I resent that. They make these family trees in these textbooks showing bacteria slowly becoming human. This is pure propaganda. 
Even Mary Leakey in Evolution it says, those trees of life with their branches of our ancestors are a lot of nonsense. Stephen Gould from Harvard University says the evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and notes of the branches. What he's saying is, only within the basic kind of animal. We see dogs produce varieties of dogs and roses produce variety of roses. We see the tips of the branches are filled in very good. That's creationism. They bring forth after their kind. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. There is no fossil evidence of any major changes. They put these trees in the textbooks as if that somehow, somehow makes it science because they can draw a line on the paper. That doesn't prove the human and the bird are related. Back in the Paleozoic or Archaeozoic era, it doesn't prove any of that, just because you can draw a line on paper. This kind of stuff is ruining children's faith. And Jesus said, Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Look, I know a lot of people who teach evolution. I have a duty as a Christian to warn them and to warn you, uh, Mr. Martell, that what you are doing by teaching this evolution theory and destroying Christian kids' faith in Scripture is going to put you in jeopardy of facing Jesus one day, Judgment Day. I don't want that for you. He's going to be very angry about this. They put telling the kids in these textbooks that all the many forms of life on earth today are descended from a common ancestor. That is certainly not what the Bible teaches, and it's certainly not what the fossil evidence shows us, and it's certainly not what we see today. There's no evidence of any kind of animal producing a different kind of animal. None. Does, dogs are still having puppies. Have them make another something different. If we came from an ape-like ancestor, well, apes are still having babies. Make them make another human. We don't see it happening today. We don't see fossil evidence of it. And it is just a religious worldview. Now, if somebody wants to believe that, that's perfectly fine. I don't care what they believe. Many questions were brought up we did not get a chance to really deal with in depth. Like the, there is more oxygen found in the older rock layers than even we have today, up to 30% oxygen, not less oxygen, a reducing atmosphere. There are no transitional species, uh, species as, the, uh, as the major evolution, edit that table, uh, as the major evolutionists agree, there are no transitional kinds whatsoever. And if you think Archaeopteryx is transitional, we'd love to get into that. You said that I reject evidence for index fossils. I quoted from your people all sorts of evolutionists showing the circular reasoning. They should just admit they take this stuff on faith. As far as the VARVs, I was just a few weeks ago, a few months ago, in Green River Formation in Wyoming. They can take the Green River VARVs, where the thousands of VARVs, they've discovered two ash layers, one above, one below the VARVs, and there's a difference of 35% in the count of the number of VARVs in between those two common event horizons, the ash layers. You can take a piece of Green River Formation, grind it to powder, pour it into running water, and it'll sort it again into layers for you. I do understand the VARVs, and it understa I understand very clearly that it represents rapid deposition, indication of a worldwide flood. The Bible view is very simple. God made the world about 6,000 years ago, created fully formed, fully functioning, which explains all the problems about uh, symbiosis relationships that are simple for the creationists, which came first, the chicken or the egg, then chicken. God made all the animals, okay? And then about 4,400 years ago, there was a flood, which indicates God's judgment on his creation. And he has the right to judge this world if he wants. This is his world, he can wreck it any time he wants. And the Bible teaches about 2,000 years ago, Jesus came and died on the cross to pay for your sins. He loves you, he wants to save you. If you don't want him, well, that's your problem, but the salvation is available. He'd be glad to forgive you. He forgave me almost 30 years ago, and I'm so glad he did. And then the Bible teaches that Jesus is coming back. Probably in the very near future. I don't know when it's going to be, and I'm not going to sell my clothes and go stand on a hill someplace, but I think it's awfully simple. And I think we better get prepared. I would challenge you to accept Christ.